Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. My name is Chris Green, and I'm a partner with Waitmans. We're here today on behalf of IOSH to talk about the new forthcoming sentencing guidelines, which will come into force on the 1st of February. Start with a little bit of housekeeping. This, I have to say, is rather unusual. We're used more to being in front of courts and trying to gauge feedback by looking at and magistrates and see what they're really thinking. We've no means of doing that, but we do have the next best thing. I'm told that if there are any technical queries throughout today's session, then please enter that in the chat box, which you'll see on the top right of your screen. Any questions and answers, we'll try to deal with them as we're going through. So we'll try and make it as interactive as we possibly can in the circumstances. Uh, even though it's all very uh, much on audio rather than visual. We'll see how we're going. Uh, firstly, just to say you, you can't see us. There are no webcams, no red buttons or no internet uh, browsers. So the next best thing is that's broadly what it would look like if you were here. I'm not sure that's uh, hugely uh, important to what we have today. Uh, but there it is, that's what we look like. So you're very welcome, and you'll see I have the perfect face for a webinar. Right, without further ado, it's just on lunchtime. I'm sure you might be tucking into your lunch as we're having the session. I have a cup of coffee here with me. Beside all of that, let's launch into today's order of events. Firstly, a tiny little bit about me. That's the who, what, when, where, and how. Who do we represent at Waitmans? Well, there's a brief list there. Been involved for about 20 years dealing with cases like this, fatalities, accidents, and the like. So please do use this as an opportunity to uh, use uh, our experience as a bit of a sounding board if there's anything you wanted to ask today. Uh, that's what we do. We advise, represent, and defend, and uh, investigate from the outset and conduct webinars. Um, you've got a little bit about where we do it, police stations, magistrates, courts, etc. I should add on to that the IOSH branch uh, at, uh, or rather the headquarters over at the Grange. I'm uh, very proud to say I sit on the uh, Food and Drink Sector Committee, uh, and it's they who we must thank for today's session. But we'll go a lot wider than that as well. It isn't just in relation to food and drink. And then finally, at the time, we defend far more than we prosecute at Waitmans, but we do keep our hand in, particularly in the context of fire safety. Uh, that's a subject very close to our heart where we prosecute as well. Right, that's what we're going to cover today. Uh, a starter will be for those of you who wanted to go back to your board of directors or who can't stay for the full hour. So we will summarize within one slide what the rest of the session will mean. Uh, we'll then launch headlong into the main course, which is why these rules are changing. And we'll go through the process that the new guidelines suggest any court needs to go through whenever a company is facing a conviction for safety offenses. Uh, if you, as we do, deal with environmental matters, that's very relevant to anybody on the call uh, who represents a very large organization and will tell you a little bit about the way the sentencing landscape is going. Uh, very brief uh, outline, if time permits, on corporate manslaughter update. And as we say, uh, we can end on questions and answers, or please do fire a few queries at us as we're going through, and we'll try our very best to deal with them uh, as we go along. Right, here is the bite-sized takeaway. If there is one thing and one thing alone that we need to draw attention to them, how about starting with the fine if ever they are convicted? Might be £10 million for health and safety offences. Might even, if it's corporate manslaughter, be as much as £20 million. The main thing that is certain from the new guidelines is that the fines across the board will be higher than they are at the moment. The other key point to, work, to bear in mind uh, at the moment is that for the first time we will have turnover and the size of a company linked directly to the level of fine. You'll know how significant that is. We'll cover that and some of the figures in due course. The next key point is that these new guidelines do not apply in the same way as the provisions 
are at the moment. So we are not talking just about fatalities. We're talking about all safety offences. The guidelines are actually wider still. They cover individual offences under the Health and Safety at Work Act, offences of corporate manslaughter, and food hygiene and food safety are there as well. So all encompassing, and this document, uh, which we have copies of in front of us, only runs to 50 pages. That will determine sentences going forward. It is interesting just to take a backward step because the law at the moment would definitively recognize a difference between cases where a fatality has ensued uh, and all other cases. That's going with the new procedures. The key point now is the risk of harm, whether or not actual harm is suffered. So quite a difference there. Uh, it's always very interesting in this line of business because even after you've finished your mitigation and the judge goes away on a sentencing hearing to decide what sort of figure he or she will impose, nobody, the barristers, the solicitors and the clients, or sometimes the court, are really quite sure where the figure is going to uh, be pitched. These guidelines will make it a lot more certain, uh, and as I say, they'll be certain because they'll be a lot higher. Uh, there are now specific figures that will be put into place, so you'll have a bit of an idea within a range, albeit a wide range, of where your fine is likely to end up. The final point is that there is no discretion other than where it's in the interest of justice to depart from these guidelines. Your starting point is that these will apply and the judge will have no discretion on that point uh, from February the 1st. Backward step, the history behind sentencing in health and safety was, again, even 20 years ago when I started doing these, the idea would be that fines would be large enough to send out a message to the shareholders and the board to deter them and to invest quite considerably in health and safety. Uh, in addition to that, of course, 2015 gives us some examples of some of the, dare I say, less direct financial implications. Uh, for health and safety practitioners on the call, you need barely reminding of uh, Alton Towers and maybe Thomas Cook and uh, the media fallout from those cases just last year. Volkswagen isn't a safety case, but it's all about reputation and corporate social responsibility. I've put another two examples on that slide for you. What's been interesting since these guidelines were first mooted was we've been round directors of boards and there are a couple of cases. The Enterprise Inns followed a couple of fatalities within that company where uh, local MPs were almost demanding uh, heads on sticks from the board of that company after a couple of fatalities. So again, a lot less tangible, but uh, real pressure there. Uh, and Sone, unfortunately, had a couple of uh, nasty scrapes with the regulators uh, and a couple of accidents and I think a fire. Uh, and uh, that, I am told, may no longer be trading at the same venue uh, as it did where some of those incidents occurred. So um, there are a multifaceted range of different uh, considerations here, quite in addition to the fines that we'll come on to now. Risks and sanctions, uh, they are imprisonable. All of this applies now for the next 11 days. We've already got unlimited fines for these offences, but as I say, the key point in these changes is to make sure anybody that thought it was a balance between safety and investment and involvement uh, it, it isn't. The stakes have changed and the fines will be a lot higher. They'll be far more analogous going forward to the sorts of fines that you see in competition or regulatory type cases or financial misdemeanours. It's never really been quite that graphic that from February the 1st, those are the levels of fines that anybody can expect after a health and safety breach. Corporate manslaughter did not give the regulators perhaps what some of them wanted, namely directors going to prison, um, but equally we will go through a few cases where they've gone to trial 
and they've been alongside companies who have been convicted of some very serious offences. So 20 years ago, I would have gone down to the court and sometimes even when you had technical defences, it would have been cheaper to just pay the fine, get out of there and get on with the business. That's no longer the case at all. Probably isn't now. It certainly won't be after February the 1st. This slide I will not dwell on hugely. This is for anybody unfortunate enough to have a fatality or a health and safety case that's going through the system and is going to be dealt with in the next 11 days. Suffice to say at the moment for fatal health and safety cases, the starting point is deemed to be £100,000. For corporate manslaughter offences at the moment, the starting point is said to be half a million pounds. All of that will go a week or so from now. We've, as I say, not always thought that the existing guidelines would be followed. Uh, all of that changes and it will be rigidly applied from a week on Monday. Already, before these guidelines are in force, we are seeing auditors of the big accounting companies asking us in relation to offences that are ongoing uh, from existing incidents, what's the likely fine going to be? We can be a little bit more um, accurate on that now, but it is a worrying message because all of them will be a lot higher up. We've seen boards get more worried about the balance between steps they need to take and the risks if they fall foul of it. But as a key message that have come out from some of the sessions I've been delivering, we are almost at the point where the very fact the accident has taken place means that you are vulnerable to some of the penalties that you're likely to face that will cover when we get onto the guidance in a moment. A um, couple of examples there. One company actually said to me, because this is such a high risk, ought we to be changing our structure and make the group uh, devolved into smaller subsidiary companies so that they all end up sounding as if they're small? That might be uh, regarded as perhaps uh, a bit extreme. But you have the point, and boards are perhaps more worried by these guidelines than ever they've been before. But there is a positive there because they're far more interested, perhaps, in some companies and want to get involved and lead the change and the cultural shift. So the practitioners, everybody in the organisation, which we all welcome, will be following the rules and rigidly complying with the procedures. The key point. From here on in, anybody that thought they might take a commercial gamble, don't. Um, there is potentially going to be more to gain than to lose by challenging some of these allegations uh, because the fines are so high um, on one uh, rule of thumb. You might as well argue it and see what happens in court. Time will tell. Right. Background and again, scene setting before we launch into the guidelines. This is a comment from one of the more senior and respected judges in a case a few years ago. And have a look at the quote that he's put up there. The gist of it is that Section 2, and to a certain extent Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act, are very widely drawn indeed. And what the judge said there is that at the end, a safety audit in most businesses would probably reveal that you're in breach of Section 2. Have that in mind, if you would, when we're going through the new sentencing process. And the point I'd like to bring out is just how easy it is to end up on the wrong side of one of these uh, offences, one of these investigations, without doing an awful lot. The bar is unbelievably high, the threshold to make you liable very low, that's a key message for your board if they don't realise that this could be them. And then again, on the same theme, we know, don't we, as practitioners, that you need to ensure people are following the procedures. If there isn't evidence about how you make sure that happens, then I'm afraid your company is potentially vulnerable for these offences and the sort of sentences that will talk about now. Right, 
from February the 1st, the new sentencing guidelines apply to companies, to individuals, to the offences of corporate manslaughter, to food hygiene and food safety. I will take a moment to just focus on that nine step process there. We've got two sevens that that will be broadly the way that any sentencing court approaches this exercise if and when these matters come before it. A few variations depending on whether you've got an individual, because clearly you can't imprison a company, uh, you can only punish a company by a fine, but the, the, the step process is pretty much the same. Step one, we've got to determine the level of culpability, the blameworthiness on the part of the defendant before the court. So at the very top end and into the highest category are the deliberate, willful, almost intentional, uh, obviously quite highly negligent breaches. And then we go down that scale in order of seriousness. We then go through what's far short of required safety standards medium is between high and low culpability and then low is that you've simply not met the obligation so you are short of the safety standards required in law so lowest end of the scale we'll factor through what that means in terms of fines in a moment the second stage within step one is to look at the harm and again the key point to bring out here we're talking about the likelihood of harm and the harm that's actually been risked. So in that first level on the left of that slide, you have death, which would always be um, at the very highest end of the scale, or, or life-threatening or life-changing type injuries, or where, for example, life expectancy may have been reduced as a result of an accident. You then go along that into levels A, B, and C, in level B, that would be where there may be a long-term effect on the victim's ability to carry out the job. So it's still very serious injury, but not quite into to level A. Um, we go down in terms of seriousness of consequences, but can I just flag up in level C, uh, the HSE within 2015 seemed very interested in occupational health and disease type issues, uh, even though that may not rank that highly on the list of priorities in your business uh, it's still there and potentially maybe a level c or even a level b in the event of some breach of safety so in addition to that a few other issues that would of course make the offense more serious so if you've exposed a number of members of the public then that becomes a more serious harm than if it's just one person similarly if it's over a period of time or if there was a fairly obvious and foreseeable way of protecting a number of workers and they've all been exposed to the same risk then clearly that's going to take you towards the top and towards the left of that table that we have there uh, the numbering's gone slightly awry that that should be uh, directly underneath where it says level A, B and C in the high harm category. Court has no discretion on any of that. It's a must rather than a may. They've look, got to look at what, what could have happened rather than necessarily just what did happen. The other point to bring out there, causation is relevant in all of these cases. It doesn't need to be the sole cause. It can be that there are a number of different parties, as with CDM or contractors, provided the breach of safety is the one thing that contributed to the outcome. That's all the prosecution would need to show. You could almost imagine there may, in the fullness of time, be more arguments between the lawyers about which category you're in and which culpability and which harm, uh, even necessarily than the facts of the case. If you can't agree, it may be the judge needs to make a determination on that uh, so as to be able to calculate the fine. Right, step two on the main course. Critical piece of research needed, if you don't already know, next time you're liaising and influencing boards, 
please ascertain whether you are defined under these guidelines as a micro company, that's less than 2 million, uh, a medium company, which is between uh, 10 and 50 million uh, of turnover this is, a small company would be between 2 and 10 million, and then we have large companies over 50 million. If you're in front of me, I might ask for a show of hands. It might sound an awful lot to say £50 million pounds turnover is a large company. Some of the large defendants that you see reported in SHP and the like, or did, um, are so far in excess of that turnover category that the guidance recognises to make it really impactful on them, you might be introducing another category altogether for a very large turnover organisation. For now, the highest category is 50 million for a large company. We'll follow that through and see what the outcome is to the fines. The other point when going in front of your boards to highlight is that to ascertain your true financial position, courts and judges will want possibly some form of, some form of forensic accountant's report to give a true idea as to its financial standing uh, and its ability to pay the fine. That can be quite difficult sometimes. We've had a few people just recently with cases that are ongoing uh, wondering whether the impact of these matters might need a report to the stock exchange. And you bear in mind this is um, all ventilated in a public court. It's all public domain. And the judge and the court have very wide powers indeed get right to the bottom of the company's financial position. So it includes dividends to the directors, loans, investment accounts, the whole lot. It's all open season. So there is another impact there, quite aside from what it actually reveals. And with all of that, they are attempting to reach a starting point for the fine, which I've underlined because it is a starting point. It can go up or down. Right. Next stage, we've got to consider any aggravating features. Those of us unfortunate enough who've had one of these cases go before the court will be familiar with all of this. So from that starting point, the value of the fine would go up if any one or other of those factors could be found. That's not an exhaustive list, but those are some examples. So clearly, um, companies with previous warnings, particularly if it relates to the accident that we're dealing with now, or people who've um, not cooperated, got in the way, uh, denied the obvious, or tried to silence victims, etc., uh, then clearly they can expect a few thousand pounds more, potentially into the hundreds of thousands, for each of those factors that are relevant. Against that, the figure may go down if you can show mitigating features. A company with a clean record over the years and a big business will fare well and a discount should be given. If it pleads guilty as a matter of law, the fine's got to be reduced. And they usually discount that by a figure of a third. Um, usually, in all the cases I've dealt with, by the time the case comes to court, most companies have put some form of remedial action in place in order to stop it from happening again. You're entitled to credit for that, and that'll reduce the penalty. Uh, those companies who are responsible and accept that they didn't get it right will fare better. And if they've actually got procedures that are generally followed but weren't on this occasion, clearly that's rather better than the scenario where you're far short of the standards required, as we said earlier, where the procedures weren't even adequate in the first place quite how we factor all of this in with the idea of having a trial and a not guilty plea, uh, well, time will tell. But uh, don't be too um, keen to accept responsibility, at least until you've uh, understood what went wrong and tried to do something about it. Assuming, of course, you can't rely on the statutory defence. Right, this is the key bit which will resonate with boards. We then, based on our culpability in our harm, the aggravating and the mitigators, uh, end up with the, uh, the, the product from the machine. And at the end of the machine, out comes the end product, and it's this. You end up into a, uh, one box, depending on whether you are large, medium, small, 
or very large or micro in this instance and you would then fall into a box with various different figures to be attached okay so here are the principles that underpin the figures for the starting points and the category range it must be a fine that reflects how far short of the standard you've actually fallen the fine has uh, courts would very reluctantly impose a fine that might jeopardize the business and put people out of work. But first and foremost, the incentive here is to make sure everybody knows it will be cheaper to comply than it will be to avoid taking the necessary steps. That's the bit at the bottom that we've highlighted there that your management and your shareholders need to know get this wrong and this is the scenario that they are in and we will be having much much higher figures pretty much across the board uh, depending on the size of the company and its turnover that's the other thing to flag up we said earlier um, the, the the jurisprudence on all of this has been completely overturned we always used to thought think that the courts welcomed um, case by case decisions and that they were all fact sensitive they didn't really apply it's gone totally the other way now and it used to be based on pre-tax prof profit uh, it's now on turnover uh, and profit only comes into it if you're actually not making a huge return on your investment or your turnover right is there any economic benefit derived from the offense those of you who've been involved in one of these cases, as we have, will know that on a frisky schedule, the aggravating and mitigating features, HSE almost always allege that the offender has fallen far short of the standards required. And then they also suggest that it's somehow related to um, deriving of commercial benefit. Um, that isn't quite the full story. At the moment, the breach would have to be a deliberate and a, a willful uh, decision to put cost in front of investment or safety measures. Um, this seems to imply that if there is in fact some economic benefit, then that will be taken into account in sentencing cases. So if you are put in an advantage over other companies that do comply uh, and who are put to the cost of complying, uh, then you will fare worse in this instance than if there's no benefit from your breach. Um, depending on how scary you want to make this briefing, uh, when you take this, and I hope it's of benefit before your boards, uh, the power is already out there to close businesses. As I say, rarely imposed, but it's there. Uh, we do see, even for local authorities, I can think of one we've dealt with very recently, uh, where the instalment option was exercised, even though it's a big public body and it's been given many years to pay a fine. Um, but there is now the horror, perhaps, of one year's pre-tax profits forming the value of the fine against a company. Uh, you will know what that would mean for your organisation, but we're not talking small change here. At the very least, that would be something that would probably change the culture going forward and would have a huge impact on any sized business. And then some other factors. Um, having gone through this more scientific formula process, uh, the judge needs to almost take a, a backward step and just see whether in all the circumstances of the case with the facts that he's heard, whether it just feels about right, whether it feels proportionate, whether it meets what the victims wanted and uh, any people who've been injured in, a, in an accident uh, and also what that's going to mean for the business going forward uh, and whether frankly it'll mean that they can improve safety uh, rather than be uh, threatened and, uh, and put out of business so we've always got to take those more social factors into account but what is clear is the fines will be going up hugely from the 1st of February. There's your reduction for assistance and a guilty plea. We said this earlier. Uh, that recognises that you've saved the court what can sometimes be six and seven weeks at public expense of having a contested trial. If you accept that you're guilty, uh, that will be taken into account and you're entitled to the reduction on the fine. So 
which way we plead and whether ultimately we might as well take our chances is critical in all of these cases. Um, I wonder if you might actually see a few more trials rather than less as a result of all of this because ultimately you just never know whether the prosecution have prepared their case properly, fully understood it, and when all is said and done, you might want to try your hand in front of 12 men and women good and, chew, uh, good and true on a jury uh, and see whether they acquit you. Sometimes they do. Uh, we can't always tell. Ancillary orders. We're asked about this a fair bit. Um, I don't know of any order a court's made to remedy any safety deficiencies. Uh, usually any company worth its salt to put that right before they're sentenced. There are powers of forfeiture and compensation. Uh, I can't see that that's going to be huge, used hugely uh, after this change comes in, but you never know. The power is there and it's mentioned specifically. We then come towards the tail end of the sentencing procedure. This is what we call the totality principle. And again, if the judge is thinking that in all the circumstances of the offence, the figure just seems a little bit too high for a business that may have done no more than have, for example, um, decent standards, good procedures, but they just weren't followed on the day, um, one of these mega fines might be deemed to be too much in all of the circumstances. Uh, and the, the lawyers, as you'd expect, will be poring over what reasons are given in writing by the judge about why the figure is as high as it is. So uh, you may see a few appeals going forward, um, but the way the wind's blowing at the moment, uh, it's difficult to predict how much of a reduction you will get. Just so I can double check on my technology, uh, it's the Q&A box. I, I'm, I'm told that there was a um, technological problem at the start. Can I just repeat, um, any questions as we're going through uh, are in the bottom right-hand part of your screen. Uh, Q&A technical questions are in the chat box above that. Right. We often get asked this question, particularly by directors as well. It is right to say that they don't become liable just because they are a director or because of the role they hold, but they do need to know that alongside pretty much all of the corporate manslaughter allegations that we've seen going to court recently, there have, in addition, been offences brought against individual directors. Very rare that you actually see them convicted of the serious uh, offences, but by that stage, of course, this has almost overtaken their lives. I think they're going to go to prison and uh, the stress on them and taking them away from the business is of huge impact, uh, let alone the eventual outcome, even if they're acquitted at the end of the day. You'll see then that the nine-step process pretty much mirrors the way you do it in relation to a company, so I won't dwell on that, but uh, uh, a few differences. Of course, we have the potential for custodial sentences with individuals, uh, as somebody who prosecutes fire safety, that I would say is getting close to the point where you have an individual after a fire uh, and there are some risk management issues that they didn't put right. And some courts might actually deem uh, a suspended sentence to be almost a starting point in its own right. I can certainly think of one case that we dealt with where there was an immediate sentence of custody. So if fire safety is anything to go by, then you have been warned. These may actually be um, quite pressing sanctions uh, and they might be biting quite quickly. We said earlier that the range went up to 20 million for a corporate manslaughter. The highest we're looking for for health and safety offences would be two years imprisonment if it got to the, um, to the Crown Court. So the sort of things that the court um, the potential for custody and the size of the fine. Um, we'd look to see whether in each question a custodial sentence would be absolutely inevitable. Well, it, it wouldn't and it isn't always, but depending on where you were on culpability and harm and say the number of deaths involved, the lawyers get a pretty, idea, pretty good idea as to uh, what you might be facing in these cases. 
Um, it is possible to impose a community order, so heaven forbid your directors might be facing the sort of sanctions that you'd see from the people who you might go down and meet uh, outside a magistrate's court, um, but ultimately that will look a lot worse for directors who knew about the circumstances and allowed them to carry on, even more so if it's a deliberate decision to put cost in front of safety aspects. Uh, I'll pause there because uh, I know one question has come through in relation to uh, UK and offshore. It was something I wanted to cover, so I'll cover it now. Uh, I where judges in the sentencing process have Googled the name of the corporate defendant before it during the lunch break, uh, and if they actually find there have been uh, offences overseas and there are common directors or somebody on the UK board ought to and probably does know about that sentence, that's a very relevant factor that they put to them. The starting point legally, however, is it is the defendant in the dock before the court and it should be its means that are looked at, regardless of whether it's uh, onshore or offshore, um, but the court can, when it looks at the overall financial position, take into account that it may have the ability to obtain finance from a parent company, for example. So the, the short answer to that one, is it the PLC or is it the, the group's finances that are looked at? Answer depends who the defendant is. Um, the way that courts sometimes deal with that is they never actually say that they've taken into account the parent companies finances because they're not allowed to but sometimes you do wonder whether the level of fine that's imposed means they must have done because it's higher than they would have imposed if it was just for the defendant company in front of the court right next slide um, as we go through from uh, one slide to another another question we have do the sentences apply retrospectively to events or prosecutions before the february starting date um, it, it all turns on when the case is sentenced. So some of these cases go on for five years. I can think of a few I've got in my caseload. Uh, unless miraculously they're summoned and they are dealt with in the next week, uh, all of these new guidelines will apply to, to anything that's in the pipeline at the moment. Um, if you get to um, February, then all of this will apply. We have another question, which is, how do you anticipate the turnover issue being applied to the public sector, uh, for example, health trusts and councils, etc.? Um, again, we can't mention names, but this has been a very relevant issue in a case that we dealt with last week. We've got um, the annual revenue budget provisions, which are set out in the guidance, and they do take of the fact that ultimately this is recycling public money so whatever the level of fine there will clearly be an impact on the ability of the defendants to deliver the services and that's taken into account now the risk is the same and it's right and proper that any public body be dealt with in a similar way but there has to be a recognition that the overall objectives of sentencing mean that with public sector cuts as they are at the moment there has to be a reduction to reflect that, um, in some respects, it's actually a pointless exercise, arguably. Um, you have to um, register the disquiet of the court. It doesn't necessarily mean that you would be penalising it the same as you would a private body. The same is true in relation to uh, NHS trusts and the like. Um, but if, if the overall effect would be that the provision of the services that the company delivers would be affected, uh, then there has to be a reduction imposed as a result. Um, will the court take into account that a company may have a high turnover, is the next question, but low profit? Answer yes. The one, the company that will fare worst would be the one that has a high turnover and a high profit. But the key point is it does recognise that somehow you're going to be able to pay it, even if potentially your profit over the last three years may not be enormous. So it's one of the factors that it doesn't operate in the way that it does at the moment because uh, pre-tax profit won't be as significant as your overall turnover. It's 
um, supposed to be reflecting uh, bigger companies uh, should feel the heat more regardless of their profit. Uh, I should have said any questions that we don't manage to cover in um, in this session, we will um, pick up after the event and we'll, we'll email you if need be. We've then got, just as we did with the um, liability against companies, financial element of the sentence. Uh, again, the court needs, when it's dealing with an individual, to just see that it feels about right and it reflects the seriousness of all of the events. Um, Forgive me, we have a problem with the slides, which I'm about to remedy. There we are. Totality principle, uh, same as we've heard before. Uh, bail seems a little draconian, but certainly for offences of gross negligence, manslaughter, uh, I can think of a few people where bail is an issue, where the police keep adjourning and adjourning while they're making more inquiries. So at the end of the day, if those defendants were convicted, then they don't serve additional time. Uh, that is very much in their favour, and there should be a reduction as a result. Corporate manslaughter. We thought maybe at the time that this might have more of an impact. You'll all know that the first few cases to go before the court were actually really quite small outfits uh, in some instances one man bands or employing no more than about eight people so to a certain extent it hasn't hit the mark uh, in that respect but this is for gross breaches and the more severe health and safety offenses that you'll all read about because they're always very high profile again we adopt the same sort of staged approach as we did for health and safety offenses uh, I'll whiz through that. Foreseeability of serious injury. Can I flag that up? Um, after one of these offences, uh, boards will always say to me, well, we would never have foreseen that this individual would act as he or she did. The key point to bring over there to them is the hierarchy of measures. And often we see in these cases there is something after the event that maybe they might have been able to do to engineer out the possibility that the individual might breach the rules. Um, it's rare that after the event there is nothing at all that the uh, company chooses to do. Same sort of standards in terms of how far short we've got all of that and the offence is aggravated if we have death or the risk of death. Same principle there as we saw earlier. Take a backward step, look at the fine in the round and see whether ultimately you think that acts as enough of a deterrent to this business. I pause there. Environmental legislation has brought in the concept of a very large organisation. It's alluded to in the guidance where it is obvious that a company is far and away into the category of large company. The idea is that we may see coming through a principle of a very large organisation. Now, it doesn't work on the basis of, for example, a billion turnover is 20 times the 50 million uh, large company threshold, and therefore you multiply the fine by 20. But there is a clear recognition that for bigger companies, uh, you may be towards the very top end of the sentencing range. And there is provision where you actually step out of the sentencing range as well. So to that extent, uh, we're still a little bit in the dark in advising very large organisations what sort of fine they might expect. Publicity orders, and I asked about this a lot, uh, we'll cover that in a minute with a couple of examples, but um, the new guidance says that's not a may, it's a must. The ordinary course of events would be that the uh, court will be looking to impose a publicity order, so it's almost self-flagellation. You publicise it um, in your, on your own website or in local press, all the circumstances of the offence, the fatality, uh, and how you got it badly wrong. Uh, that is a provision that uh, certainly worries some organisations in relation to health and safety. A couple of examples for you. We've chosen one where it is a company into the large category, it's turnover is 100 million, 
and the culpability is only medium. Now that could be as little as good procedures that weren't followed on the day still potentially might take you into the category of medium culpability. Harm, we've chosen one towards the lower end of the scale. It may be, I don't know, broken limb that repairs and then the individual who suffered the injury is back at work, for example. Um, your starting point for that under these guidelines from February would be 300,000, but, but have a look at the next bullet. Um, depending on aggravating features and some of those other factors applying, it could actually be up to 750,000. That's not for a fatality, it's not for gross negligence. That might be deemed to be one of the more there are the routine type cases that the HSE might prosecute, uh, and those are the stakes. So you have been warned. We've got the environment sentencing. The reason why I put that in is because although it doesn't bind safety or corporate manslaughter, the court that's imposed these high fines and talked about very large organisation is likely to be the same one that's driving forward sentences on safety so uh, I don't think you'd anticipate too much change if ever anybody appeals any Crown Court cases when the sentence appears to be quite high. I've got a question coming through here uh, and it says, I won't read out who it's from, we're a division of a UK limited company with ultimate ownership via a US listed business. At which level would turnover of the business be judged? This trading, uh, forgive me, it won't let me go to the bottom. Um, I think the answer is, would they take into account the parent or the subsidiary? The starting point is the subsidiary. But as I say, if you are backed and there is finance available from your parent, uh, that's not something that a court would ignore. So part of a big global entity uh, clearly looks as if you'll have deeper pockets and the sentence would have less of an impact on you uh, if it's a little bit higher. Uh, have there been any mock trials to tell about the outcomes? What a great question that is. Um, we, I think it's fair to say, at the IOSH food conference, uh, let's plug for IOSH here, apologies, I'll move on. In October, we will be conducting a sentencing exercise when we know what the first few of these cases look like uh, to help you with how all of that's going to work. Not yet, but it's in hand. Another question, could you explain how this will apply to government departments and who will ultimately be responsible? Um, probably the answer to that one lies in the guidance document itself about NHS trusts. Um, the answer is still underpinned by the fact that you don't want to be fining government departments because then they can't do their business as effectively. But there has to come a point, as in some of these large corporate scandals or some of the NHS issues where the fine has to have an impact in order to deter others. Um, Crown immunity is gone. Uh, they can be dealt with in exactly the same way as any private business and any corporate entity. Um, but that there is a reflection in these principles that you, you won't be fined quite as high as you would if you're a large PLC. Compensation. Uh, the top one is relevant there. This always raises eyebrows at board level and some of the sessions we've been running. Um, there is no discretion now. Wherever you have a conviction of this sort, the court must, not may, consider disqualification of directors. We all know that provision's already out there, uh, potentially as a maximum of 15 years disqualified. I've never known that. It's pretty rare. But it's out there. Uh, and people will be looking at it more now, again, with the aim of driving home the message to the board if they can um, make sure they're in safety and to stop any potential breaches. Public orders we've covered. Okay, adverse publicity, particularly for those with very, very strong brands and the household names, a uh, huge issue for manufacturing, food and the like. We've probably covered that. Um, we have had two cases in corporate manslaughter where publicity orders were awarded. They never saw the light of day because the effect of the fine was so enormous that the companies never had to actually comply with it. Is understanding. Uh, forgive me, I wasn't involved in those cases, but the order is there. 
we never saw the outcome, so I, I couldn't put up on screen a website or any um, full page advert in the press. Other examples, again, uh, Peter Mawson was a corporate manslaughter case last year because of the effect of the fine um, and other things potentially, who knows, the company didn't trade much longer. So again, the one example we could have cited about a publicity order, but we don't know how that's going to look in practice either. But it's out there and we think that may become the norm. A question I've been asked recently, are the courts imposing fines now which reflect that these guidelines are just around the corner? Answer, no, they shouldn't and they can't. That's not the law. Although there is a recognition that the guidelines that we're currently using for another week or two uh, do actually date back from 2010. So there will be an uplift from those figures. But um, even if you look at some of those cases I've put on that slide there, two million for national grid might seem a huge amount. But of course, the counter argument is look at the size of the business and what would that represent in terms of its turnover and uh, make of that what you will. Um, some anecdotal evidence that some practitioners were attempting to try to get cases dealt with before these guidelines came through. Uh, I'm not sure that's a terribly sensible uh, suggestion. If uh, you had a decent argument, then argue it would be the way we'd advise our clients, uh, regardless of when it's argued. Um, I'll pause now because we're coming towards the end. These guidelines derive from a consultation that took place around about this time last year uh, or a little bit later and there were some examples of how it was thought these guidelines might look in practice. First example, this is into the medium category of company. Its turnover is 40 million. It's a fatality but not a corporate manslaughter. Common scenario perhaps workplace transport and a reversing vehicle. Um, what we have in this case study is the idea that there were procedures in place uh, and a defined traffic route, although perhaps it wasn't as rigidly enforced as it might have been. And then the example gives that the company knew that was the case. So we then go into a range under these new guidelines of as a maximum of 1.3 million, but a starting point of 540. If I tell you that under the current guidelines, you'd be fairly confident of arguing that one as less than £100,000, um, because although it's fatal, there don't look to be many more aggravating features, then you have the idea. It looks as if these sentences will be going up by two and a half times three and more, depending on the circumstances of each case. Another example, uh, going to the top end of the scale, large or almost very large drinks manufacturer. This is a case where it isn't a fatality, uh, it's an arm injury to an employee, isn't able to return to the work um, place after the event and the work guards around but it, it wasn't on the day and it looks as if there'd been custom and practice to remove the guards. The board didn't know that was going on. Um, have in your own mind where you think that would be pitched at the moment. I'd argue that would be a sub £100,000 fine at the moment. Well, as from February, that's a starting point, not, not a maximum, uh, and the range could be up to £250,000. The consultation didn't take into account some of the recent comments uh, that we've heard in environmental law about very large organisations. So make of that what you will those figures potentially might be a little on the light, light side. Who knows? Um, final query, and this relates to a case you may have seen uh, reported or was very similar, uh, a medium-sized manufacturer, this one, fall from height sort of case that uh, I'm sure people in the call will recognize. We certainly do. Uh, goes up, not all part of the business, to check whether there's a leak on and of course falls off because there's no edge protection harnesses and the like. Uh, fatal accident for a medium company and there's what you might be facing. If we say that that's very similar to a case where the actual fine was 480,000, uh, you have the idea. Uh, it's quite a lot more 
if that ever comes before the court after February the 1st. Uh, people always ask for corporate manslaughter trackers, so I think bar one or two, that's pretty much up to date. Um, you see there that the fines in actual fact haven't been uh, £500,000 as a starting point and above, uh, bar, bar one case. That's because most of the cases brought so far are small companies and simply couldn't afford to pay. A couple of examples there where the fines actually put them out of business. Uh, I won't dwell on that, but we haven't yet seen large corporate entities really feel the full force of the corporate manslaughter legislation. A little bit about uh, liability of individuals. There's always gross negligence manslaughter. Manslaughter tracker a moment ago. There's usually directors or senior managers prosecuted as well. Very rare for them actually to end up convicted. Um, what often happens is when the company indicates that it'll plead guilty, the prosecutor reviews it and decides actually it isn't worth pursuing the individual. By that stage, of course, however, the damage is already done. It, this is pretty rare. It's a very high hurdle indeed, uh, and you don't see too many of these. So we are talking about criminally, intentionally, very almost willfully flagrant um, extreme breaches of health and safety. That's the stuff of a gross negligence manslaughter. Uh, with hindsight, however, of course, it's pretty easy after a death for any prosecutors suggest that's what they're dealing with and you'll at the very least be investigated for that and go through the process even if you don't end up being convicted of it. Uh, we'll finish very briefly. Uh, we don't need a death and we don't need gross negligence of course. Um, for a few years now section 37 has been imprisonable. If that goes to the Crown Court that might be a two-year sentence of imprisonment. Consent or connivance or neglect you don't become liable, as I said, just because you're a director, uh, but it isn't taking much these days. So something in addition to your role means that you are dealt with in the same way as the company. Recent example, did anybody see this? Just to close on, uh, a paramedic was called after a man collapsed. This was all shot on CCTV outside the hospital. Um, the suggestion was that he thought that the poor chap was inebriated. Uh, in fact, unbeknownst to the, uh, the paramedic, uh, the chap was having a cardiac arrest. Um, he was charged with a Section 7 Health and Safety at Work offence, reasonable care for yourself and others, uh, and he pleaded guilty. Um, they couldn't prove the causation, but he received a suspended term of imprisonment. Finally, then, for the consultants out there on the call, uh, you may have seen this one, an immediate sentence of imprisonment for a consultant in one of these basement uh, excavations where it collapsed, as it often does, and the risk assessment hadn't factored in um, the, uh, the propping and the, uh, the pinning as perhaps it ought to have done. Uh, that's what happened to Mr. Golding. You'll see all of this in the slides, which I think will be available. Uh, final question before we finish. Are directors failing in their duty, the question says to the company, if they sell the company to sell themselves, or save themselves, um, it's usually the other way around. Um, so the company would normally uh, plead guilty uh, in return for the director being exonerated from the proceedings. Um, sorry, it says sell the company to save themselves. There'd be a potential conflict of interest depending on the size of the company um, because the company's interest may not be the same as the director's. So what you have to be a little bit careful in that situation. What you don't do is have one blaming the other because invariably what that means is uh, you all end up getting convicted. Uh, what does it mean for you then? Fines linked to turnover, we've covered that. They will increase hugely. The publicity that goes with that will be far more than ever it was and we bring it right back to where we started these fines are now to have a real economic impact on organisations to bring home to both management and shareholders the need to comply with the legislation. So any audits, any near misses, any issues they know about, previous improvement notices and the like, please can we make sure they close them out and there is some proof that they have done that. Those are the sort of cases where you might find individuals liable and you might find an allegation of manslaughter rather than straight health and safety at work. If I can click this last slide on, I think 
we're done. Final thing to leave you with, uh, we started with a photo of the inside of our building. Um, if you think this is all very scary and shock, inside of our building, uh, thankfully we had a near miss. Um, but if you see that tower scaffold in the middle of the picture, uh, if that had been attached properly to the left-hand side of the building, then that's where I'm talking to you from now. Corporate manslaughter, we've been through. It's in the slides. Tried to do this a bit of a handout. We won't cover it now. Um, the key point, make sure your procedures are followed regardless of how adequate they appear on paper. That's a message to leave you with that should go back to the board of everybody whose companies are represented on this call. I've gone very slightly over, for which I apologise. Uh, I think there is only one other question. Uh, no, we're done. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, those are the uh, email details. If you have any questions, please do get in touch. Uh, I hope that's been of benefit to you. And I hope you never need any of it. Good luck.